Please welcome Juliana Margulies. When my brother tells me he's been seeing a psychiatrist, I say, that's great, Jack. He says, why? You think I'm fucked up? <laughs> I say, how'd you find him? He says, what makes you think my psychiatrist is a man? Her name is Mary Pat Delmar. And Jack tells me she's brilliant. He says, she blows me away. And I think they must be talking a lot about junior high. Wow. He smiles. I told her you'd say that. When he tells me how beautiful she is, I say, but not so beautiful that you have a hard time concentrating? She's pretty beautiful, he says, plus impressive. She got a scholarship to college, for example, and she put herself through med medical school. She grew up in rural Tennessee where her parents still run a luncheonette. I say, she told you that? <laughs> yeah, he says, why? I don't think of psychiatrists talking about themselves too much. It's not until he tells me they're not in Freudian analysis and breaks out laughing that I realize he's not in analysis at all. <laughs> Mary Pat is his new girlfriend. He laughs like a madman and I say, very funny, though it is in fact very funny just to hear Jack laugh, as well as a huge relief. Our father died not even two months ago. My eggs and Jack's pancakes are set before us and we stop talking to eat. We're at Homer's, the diner around the corner from his apartment in the village. I ask how he met Mary Pat. He tells me Pete referred her. For a moment he gets waylaid talking about the fishing shack he helped Pete restore this summer. Pete lives year round on Martha's Vineyard with his Newfoundland, Lila, who expresses her heartache by howling to Billie Holiday records Dog, you don't know the trouble I've seen. <laughs> Jack says Pete called when MP moved to town. I think he's always been a little in love with her. I say nothing. I have always been a little in love with Pete. Though Jack didn't say he'd bring Mary Pat, I'm a little disappointed when he arrives at Homer's without her. Just coffee, he says to the waiter. He tells me that MP was mugged on her way home from work, and he was up half the night trying to calm her down. Jesus, I say, and ask where and when, and was there a weapon? A knife, 10 p.m., a block from her apartment on Avenue D. I say, she lives on Avenue D? D is for drugs, D is for danger, D is for don't live on Avenue D unless you have to. Jack says, it's all she can afford. I say, well, I, I thought psychiatrists cleaned up. Maybe in private practice. As Dr. Delmar, Mary Pat treats survivors of torture in a program at NYU Hospital. From spending weeks at my father's bedside, I have become a lot alive to a level of pain I've never known. Now I feel it on every street of Manhattan, in every column in the newspaper, and just the idea of someone who works to ease suffering eases mine. I say, when can I meet her? Soon. Sounding like a worried mother, I say, she should take a cab when she works late. I know, but she says walking is her only exercise. Jack is standing outside the White Horse Tavern when I arrive. He says, want to sit outside? It's November. <laughs> uh, why would I want to sit outside? He tells me that MP will. After spending all day in the hospital, she craves fresh air. He takes off his leather jacket and hands it to me an act of chivalry in the name of Mary Pat. I give in. You love this girl. He howls a mock forlorn. I do, imitating a country singer or Newfoundland, or Newfoundland. We maneuver our legs under the picnic table. We are the sole outsiders, and Jack has to go inside to get the waitress. We both order scotch for warmth. Jack yawns and tells me that he and Mary Pat were up most of the night discussing his new screenplay. He tells me her notes were unbelievably smart, incredibly smart, smarter than his actual screenplay. <laughs> he, 
It occurs to me that I have never heard him more sure of any woman and less sure of himself. He catches sight of his dramaturg across the street and I turn to look. She is tall and skinny in high heels. Her cheeks are flushed and when she sees Jack smile, she activates her dimples. <laughs> her hand is limp in mine, her voice shivery. Pleased to meet you. She kisses Jack full on the mouth and then she says she thinks she's coming down with something. <laughs> <clears throat> Do we mind sitting inside? Once we're seated, I pretend, as I always do with Jack's girlfriends, that I already like her. I tell her that I can hardly sit in high heels, let alone walk in them. How does she do it? She says, I don't know. <laughs> Jack puts his hand across her forehead and his eyebrows slant up in worry. You have a fever. Uh, if you're sick, I say, we can have dinner another night. No, no, she says, I like a fever. Her smile is wane, her skin shiny, you know, through the glass darkly. I do not know. <laughs> I'm not even sure I've heard her correctly. Her voice is so quiet, I strain just for fragments. We pick up our menus. I'm gonna have a cheeseburger and fries, I say. Jack says, same here. Mary Pat says, I don't think I can eat a whole one by myself. You can share mine, he says. You don't mind? My brother, who usually slaps my hand if I take one of his fries, <laughs> does not mind. When our cheeseburgers arrive, Mary Pat ignores the extra plate brought for sharing and eats right off Jack's. Instead of cutting the burger in half, she takes a bite, and then he does. She even uses his napkin to wipe her mouth. I am reminded of the aid organization, Doctors Without Borders. <laughs> Jack told me that you met through Pete, I say. Oh yes, she says, he warned your brother about me. And the two of them seem to think it's funny. I play along. <laughs> what did he say? Jack asks Mary Pat, what did he say? She says, I'm trouble. Her voice is so lush with sex, I think, hey, MP, I'm right here, Jack's little sister across the table. <laughs> Her body reacts to the smallest shift in his. They are in constant bodily contact. She doesn't touch Jack directly, but rubs herself against him almost incidentally, like a cat. The one time he reaches for her hand, she lets him hold it for less than a minute and then she takes it back and hides it in the dark under the table. Maybe because of her whispery voice or her ethereal skinniness or her glass darkly fever, Mary Pat gives the impression of not quite being here at the table, here at Whitehorse Tavern, here on earth. As though to assure myself of my own existence, I counter her quiet voice by raising mine, counter her little bites by taking big ones. I try to talk to her, but it's just me asking questions and her answering them. My questions get longer, her answers shorter. Still, I don't quit. I'm like a gambler who keeps thinking, maybe the next hand. <laughs> the name of her parents' luncheonette, Del Mars. The division of labor, her father cooks, her mother serves. If I were at Del Mar's now, we'd order meat and two. M meat and two? M one meat and two sides. Oh, I love sides, I ask, which are the best? <laughs> Butter beans, she says. Grits, if you like grits. I smile the smile of a grits liker. <laughs> though not a single grit has ever passed my lips. I say, did you hang out at the luncheonette a lot growing up? She nods. I say, was it fun? No, she says, making clear that she doesn't want to talk about this or talk to me or talk. She says, excuse me, 
and she goes to the ladies' room. What? I say to Jack. He says she can't talk about her father. Were we talking about her father? When she returns, Jack puts his arm around her. I say, I, I, I didn't mean to pry. Mary Pat says, a wounded, don't worry about it. <laughs> Jack does not call to ask what I think of Mary Pat, as he has with every other girlfriend he's ever introduced me to. He doesn't call at all. When I call him, he's in bed with a fever of 103. <laughs> I offer to bring him soup, and he says that he has soup and juice and everything he needs left over from when he took care of Mary Pat. A week later, when I call to ask if we're meeting at Homer's, he's still in bed. He says that his fever is down. He just doesn't feel good. I say, what's the matter, buddy? Our father's nickname for Jack. She hated my revision. What? I told you she gave me notes on my script, he says. She said I didn't understand anything. I say, you want me to come over? Yeah, he says, and I do. His night table's a mess of drugs, NyQuil, DayQuil, Sudafed, Theraflu, a sticky dose cup, a mug, and a tea bag that looks like a mouse in rigor mortis. <laughs> His bed is covered with screenplay pages and used Kleenexes, which he says are of equal value to Mary Pat. Does she know that your father died nine weeks ago? He says, I asked her to be honest. It takes me a minute to understand that he's defending her against me. I clean up, I take his temperature, I make tea. I'm stirring soup when Mary Pat calls, apparently contrite. She's coming over, Jack says, which means I'm supposed to go. Jack arrives at Homer's, blurry with exhaustion and hobbling. He tells me that he's been working out. I just overdid it, he says, something indecipherable through a yawn and up really late last night. I ask if he was working on his screenplay. No, he yawns, we stayed up late talking. Don't you babies sleep through the night? He says, she's, up, she's upset. I think of the work that Mary Pat does and the story she must hear every day. I woke up, Jack says, and she was crying. I nod in sympathy. His voice is cloudy with sleep. She kept telling me how sorry she was. I say, why was she sorry? He seems suddenly to focus and to realize that he might not want to tell me this story. He hesitates before going on, but he does go on, too tired to obey his instincts. She's still in love with her old boyfriend. The words seem to spell out the end, and yet I don't hear the end in his voice or see the end in his face. I say, if she loves him so much, how come she broke up with him? I watch Jack try to remember she didn't feel she deserved to be happy back then. What comes to mind is Jack's rendition of Talking Head song, which he changed from psycho killer to psycho babble. I think of the refrain, run, 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 run away. I say, when didn't she deserve to be happy? Her freshman year, he says, he was a senior physics major. He played squash. I'm confused. So she's been seeing him since her freshman year? No. She ran into him? No. I say, but she wants to get back together with him? No. He says he's married with two kids. She doesn't even know where he lives. It occurs to me that I might understand this story better if I were really, really tired. My brother's eyes are, shi are shiny and tiny, and his skin clam-colored. His hand trembles as he returns his coffee cup to the puddle in his saucer. He says, the good thing is, and drifts off. I say, the good thing is, she finally feels like she deserves to be happy. Jack calls and says that he wishes he hadn't told me about MP's old boyfriend. I say, I understand. And I do. There are things two people say in the middle of the night that don't make sense to a third at breakfast. <laughs> the next few times I ask, Jack tells me that Mary Pat is great. And then she is good. 
and then she is fine, and then she is okay. Saturday night at 4 a.m., he calls me from her apartment. I know without asking that he is sitting in the dark. I can hear it in his voice. I blew it, he says. I say, I'm sure you didn't. I did, he says. I blew it. How? I just blew it, he says. I blew it. Just trying to remember that we're having a conversation, I say. <laughs> and your goal is to impart information. He says, I should have proposed to her at the boathouse. When I don't answer, he says, in Central Park, as though to clarify. <laughs> that was the perfect moment. <clears throat> I force myself to say the consoling words. I'm sure you'll have another perfect moment. No, he says, she said that was the perfect moment. <laughs> and now we can never get it back. Hold on there, I say. You've known each other for like 20 minutes. He doesn't answer. And I hear how irrelevant these words are to him. Just bear with me, I say. Forget about perfect moments for a minute. Do you really want Mary Pat to be your wife? You want Mary Pat to be the mother of your children? Yes, he says. I do not ask him if he thinks he would be happy with Mary Pat. Happiness, I realize, is beside the point. I realize, too, that he doesn't want me to help him figure anything out or to help him feel better. He wants me to help him win Mary Pat. OK, I say, here's what I think you should do. Don't ask her to marry you. Give her room, I say. Try not to need anything from her just, just for a little while. How can I tell that I have said something he wants to hear? The silence is just the same, but I know. I imitate our father's calm authority. We'll figure the rest out in the morning. I've only called Pete a few times in my life, and as soon as I hear his hello, I remember why. He settled in for the night, his feet by the fire, Dostoevsky in hand, Lila's head on his lap. A phone call is breaking and entering. We talk, but only 1% of Pete comes to the phone. You get close to Pete by swimming, or clamming, or fishing, by weeding his garden, by singing while he plays guitar. Every exchange is more strained than the last until I get to the emergency of my brother's love. When I finish, he says, I don't think there's anything you can do, Soph. He is sympathetic, but resolute, as though describing a house beyond restoration. You don't understand, I say. I think he's going to propose to her. He says, they all propose. <laughs> For myself, I say, did you propose? He laughs, no. It occurs to me that I have never known Pete to have a girlfriend. How are you? You know, he says, OK. How's Lila? He says, how are you, Lila? <laughs> what I hear in the moment of quiet that follows is Martha's Vineyard in winter. The clouds in the sky, the wind on the beach, and the cold that stays on your clothes, even when you're inside. Jack does not return my calls. I ask my mother if she's heard from him. She says she has. I can't wait to meet Mary Pat. <laughs> I know how hard my little brother Robert is working, and I'm reluctant to worry him. But when he asks me what I think of Mary Pat, I tell him everything. Jack's losing weight. He doesn't sleep anymore. It occurs to me this is how cults weaken the will of initiates. <laughs> Robert says, it sounds like he's in love, and adds that the world's most coveted state is characterized by unrelieved insecurity and nearly constant pain. <laughs> the effect of his words is to remind me that it has been a long time since I've been in love. What about you, Robert says, have you met anyone? He always asks, and I always have to say no. And I say no now. For the first time, he says he wants to introduce me to someone he knows, a pediatric heart surgeon. That's good, I say. I have a pediatric heart. <laughs> he says, don't talk that way about my little sister. Before we hang up, I say, 
Are you in love? No, he says. I ask if his wife knows. <laughs> of course, he says. Naomi's the one who told me. When Jack finally calls me at work, he says, can you meet me instead of hello? When, he says, now. Before I can ask where, he hangs up. Even though it's 6 p.m. on a weekday, I assume Homer's, and I'm right. Jack's at the counter, his head bowed. His face looks haggard, but his body's surprisingly buff. He says that he can't sleep or eat or think or write. Apparently, you can work out, though. She won't call me back, he says. I say, I know how that feels. He misses the jibe. We had a fight. About what? It wasn't really a fight, he tells the waiter, just coffee. Oh, he'll have pancakes and bacon with that. To Jack, I say, or do you want eggs? I don't want anything. I tell the waiter, he'll have pancakes. Jack doesn't even seem to hear. You seem like you're in a coma, I say, and as soon as I say it, I feel sick. Our father was in a coma for days. And I have said coma the way people who don't know anything about it do, which is like calling out, can we get another coma over here? <laughs> I say, I meant stupor. But Jack is in such a stupor, he didn't even notice my coma. <laughs> when his pancakes come, he pushes the plate aside. He sighs and sighs again. His voice is so quiet. It's as though he's talking to himself when he says, I can't hit her. Sorry? I can't hit her, he says. And I realized how tired and desperate he must be to say these words to me. And, and you, you want to hit her? He shrugs. She wants me to. In bed, I say. Of course in bed, he says. Where else? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I say. <laughs> Of course she wants to hit you. Of course she wants you to hit her in bed, and you can't. But go on. <laughs> she thinks it means I don't love her. I say, can I hit her? <laughs> Sophie, his voice is a reprimand. Her father used to beat her. I think she probably deserved it. But then I turn into a human being. <laughs> my brother's face is so tired and so sad, it makes my face sad and tired. Buddy, but even as I say it, if I were you, I'd try to get out of this thing. I know that nothing I can say, no matter how wise or how well put, will separate him from his woman. He says, it's not like I have a choice. I say, uh, of course you do. She's been seeing someone else, he says, some guy she works with. I am about to say a victim, but I correct myself in time. <laughs> a survivor? He defends Mary Pat even now. She would never go out with a patient. There are so many things I could say about Mary Pat. I could call her the one word you say for occasions such as this the only sacred profanity. But my brother loves this woman, whoever she is, and deriding her would only deride him for loving her. What else is there to say? So I tell him that I've been editing a celebrity diet book at work. I say, news flash, eat less, exercise more. <laughs> when I slide the plate of pancakes in front of him, he says, I'm not hungry. Do you think I care if you're hungry, I say? This has nothing to do with hunger. Hunger is beside the point. Hunger is a luxury you can't afford. I pour syrup over the pancakes. When I cut into the stack, he says dryly, Lego my ego, <laughs> repeating a commercial circa our childhood. You need a nap, I say. He eats one bite and then another. While he finishes his pancakes, I plan the future. I will walk him home and up the stairs to his apartment. He'll lie down. I'll shop for groceries. I'll take him to a movie and out for dinner. In case my father is listening, I think we will look after each other. Juliana Margulies.
Wonderful. Catherine Irby, Richard Kind, Karen Pittman, Juliana Margulies, Elizabeth Strout, and Fred Heckinger. I'm Meg Wallitzer. Thank you for being here, and good night, everybody.